Hello and welcome back. Last time we created a digital clock which displays the current time. So as you can see it's 20.54 or 8.54 p.m. Today I want to continue exploring the canvas. So let's go ahead and do just that. In our canvas if we right click and go to UI we will see that image and draw image is the next thing that we will be exploring. So let's go ahead and select image. And currently we get the we get this blank white rectangle. That's because we're missing a source image. Currently it's none, but it's looking for a sprite. So we can click on this circle here. And these are some sprites that come with Unity. You can of course import your own sprites and use them, which you should definitely do because you can't use these for too many things. Let's go ahead and select one of these, maybe this input input field background. And then the next par the next, par next parameter here is color. If your sprite is white, which this one is, we can then change the color of this sprite on this image. The ne next up is material. You can add materials to your image if you so desire, but I don't do that very often. I don't see the need in that. Raycast target is if you want this to be a target of raycasts. We'll cover raycasts in a program tutorial, but for for now you don't need to worry about that. You can disable, enable, it doesn't really matter. And then we have image type sliced. So this image by default, the type of this image is sliced. You can see here how it's sliced into nine chunks. And fill center is enabled. If we disable it, we will have this nice outline. Let's re-enable it and let's explore other image types. So if I select this, I'm going to get a drop down and simple is is the most common default image type. You can see it looks exactly it looks in the game exactly like it, it does here. We can preserve the aspect ratio, but doesn't really matter. So let's go ahead and continue. We have tiled, which is pretty similar to sliced in it, it will tile a image. So for example, if I take the snub image, you can see how we have multiple of them. That's because this sprite has no borders. It wasn't set up to be a tiled sprite, but if you're using tiles in your game, you can, you should be set the image type to be tiled. And finally we have filled. So now in this, this circle here, it's a filled image and the fill amount is one, which means it's filled up to the up to 100%. And we can decrease this to change the fill amount. But currently the fill method is 360 degrees, which I think is the best one, but we'll get to it last. Let's first go ahead and go to horizontal. And then we have the fill origin. Is, the, is this object going to be filled from left or right? Let's just go left for now. And if I decrease this, you can see how the image is slowly disappearing. If I select right, it's going to be disappearing from the right. I mean to the right. Okay, so let's go ahead and show you vertical is the same now from the bottom from top and things like that. But I think the best fill method is definitely radial 360. So let me show you. It kind of looks like a loading screen which we can use for loading or things like that. So from zero to one, you can see how we gradually fill it up. You can also set it to be clockwise or counterclockwise. And finally, we can set the native size of this image. So yeah, there you go. Another thing to note, which is really important, is if we go to our scene view, and let's select 2D here, you can see that this is our canvas. And this is basically the viewport of the player. If I select the canvas and go to a canvas scaler, and UI scale mode, I'm going to set scale with screen size. Now, whenever we um, change the size of the game, of the game, the UI will scale with it. This is really important for mobile games. If you're making games for Android, you know, they have screen screens that range from many resolutions. And if you do this, this text will be no matter no matter what resolution or display a user has, this text will always be placed here. So just imagine this canvas is his display, his monitor. So no matter how, how much you 
you scale it, it's always going to be displayed here. Okay, let's continue. So now we spoke about images. Let's go ahead and continue. Next we have raw image. And raw image is pretty similar to image. It only has a small difference if let's get a texture. So this looks for a texture, whereas the image looked for a sprite. Let's go ahead and get the background texture. Now you can see the raw image here has color as well and material and raycast which are some of the basic components required for images in Unity but now we have UV rect here basically we can move this around and you can see how this this rectangle goes off of the image so the rectangle isn't the image but it's kind of like part of the image and it can go outside of the image this is our image here and we can you see move the rectangle we can also increase the size of this image let's say like that and now this rectangle has more breathing room as you can see you can also set the native size back of the image so that's basically the difference between the raw image and the image so thank you for watching and next time we will be talking about buttons toggles sliders and all those things so uh, thank you for watching again and i'll see you next time hello and welcome back so last time we talked about images and raw images we also spoke about the importance of canvas and its scaling with screen size and today let's delete this raw image let's go ahead and go to ui and button is up next so let's click on this button you can see unity has created a button for us the button has a image so first off i can drop down this game object and i have this text component which is basically like a normal text it's the text inside the button so i can say click me i can change the font i can change the size the alignment and the color of the text basically everything you previously had in the basic text text box you now have in here they're basically the same i mean they are the same so we can also access it through scripts and then the parent of this text is the button and it has the, a image component which is the sprite which is the sprite for the button we can change it but it doesn't look good let's work with the default one for now we could use this one but it doesn't really matter we can also change the color of the button basic image stuff and then we have the button component here we have interactable which is set to true if you want this button to be well interactable you set it to true then we have the transition options now we have we can set this to be none you just click on the button and things happen or we can set it to be color tint we can have the normal color and then a highlighted color let's say this one and then a pressed color let's say red and disabled color maybe black so now if I play this, you will see when I hover over this button, we get this hover color, but if I press it, we get the red color. We're not yet seeing the black one because we're not disabling the button. Let's just... Then we have the color multiplier and the fade duration. We can... Basically, how, how long does it take for the color to appear and disappear? Navigation can be horizontal, vertical, automatic, or explicit. Just leave it automatic. And let's check out other transitions. We have sprite swap. We can basically select different sprites for when they're highlighting. Currently, we don't have too many sprites, so I just set a knob when I hover over, you can see. Then we have animation. We can create a animation that happens when we click on this, but I won't be doing that because Animations tend to take up a, a, a lot of time. Okay, now here we have this on-click method. And we can select a few things that will be happening when we click this button. So if we, if we click this plus here. First off, we have off, editor and runtime, and runtime only. So if you set off, this means that this function will never be working. If we say editor and runtime, it means that this function will be working even in the editor so if we test our game in unity it will be working and if we select and it will also be wor working when the game is running 
the executable and also runtime only it will only be running when the game is playing so when we run the executable if you select this we won't be able to test it in the engine so set editor and runtime now here it asks, it asks us for a game object so let's click on this now we can select many game objects i'm going to select this cube which has our test script so let's go back here and i selected the cube and now no function i can click this and i get a ton of these options so game object and i can play around with it i can play around with the transform of the object i can play around with the box collider the mesh renderer the rigid body basically everything that this cube has on the button press i can change some values here but also what i can do is let me go back i can go to test script which is also a component of our cube and i can maybe call a method or change a variable currently i can't call any methods because they aren't public so let's go back into our test script and see create clock is a private method so if i call public if i say public other scripts will be able to access it and under objects so this means that the button will be able to call this method so now i'm going to remove create clock from the update method and back into unity i will click on my button and go to no function test script and here we should see let me see hmm did i not save this test script public void create clock why am i not seeing it here let's see test script whoops oh here it is Cre create clock okay so when i click the button the create clock script will, will be played so currently if i run the game placeholder text hasn't changed because we haven't called our create clock method but if i click the button we get the current time now you will notice that the seconds aren't passing that's because we only get the time when we click on the button you see whereas previously it was called each frame in the update method now i have to be have to keep pressing the button to get the time but you, you get the idea how this works we can also add an, more functions to this button press we can say we can make different things happen but for now i think this is more than enough to understand how buttons work you can move this button around of course as you would move anything around in the in this editor by changing the position x y and z values for now i will leave this as it is maybe let's position it to see like this just reset the x let's set it to 50 uh, 150 okay and let's say y minus 100 uh, 150 okay so that's our button that when we click we get the current time later we will this is really important using buttons well your main menu will be con con will be made up of buttons and your game if you're developing for android or ios you will most likely you will definitely be having buttons and buttons are really important and it's really easy to use them you just call different methods from different buttons so let's see next up will be a toggle but this episode is getting pretty lengthy so i'll do that in another, le another lecture I uh, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Hello and welcome back. So last time what we did is we created this button that when we click it, it just gets the current time from our system. And now if we go to canvas and under UI, you'll see that the next thing up on our list is toggle. So let's go ahead and create a new toggle object. Here we can see it, it's placed in the center and just as the button, it has we can drop it down it has a few child objects first off is label which is just a text that currently says toggle we can change that to maybe hello just to show you that you can change the text and then we have a background and that background as well has a child first off the background is a image 
as you can see, it has a component image here, which is the UI sprite, which is this. Can I? This is the image, and then it has a child, which is this check mark. And basically, it, it just disables or enables the check the child depending on if the toggle is on or off. Okay, let me just zoom out the scale here. Let's go ahead and reposition our toggle. I'm going to set its anchor preset to be to the left, and then just reset the x and y, and then set the x maybe to 100, and this to a little maybe 200. Okay, and divide to maybe 50. Let's say 100. Okay. Now, if we click on the toggle, let me just collapse the children. And that's how objects are. This is the canvas is a parent and each of these objects are children of this parent. And children can have more children like this button has a text child. And the toggle has a background child which has a checkmark child. But the, the toggle also has a label child which isn't a child of the background. Okay, so let's go back to the toggle parent. And just as the button, we have this toggle script here. And very similar to the button, we have interactable, either true or false. And then we have the transitions here, which are the same as the button. We can say none, color tint, sprite swap, or animation. We covered all of this in the previous lecture, so I won't go into I won't go into explaining how this works. Then we have a color multiplier and the fade duration, the navigation. Basically, it is the same as the button, except the script here is on value changed. So basically, whenever we change the value here, we can execute something. Toggles are really important in games, mainly in options menus. For example, you can say, do you want this game to be in full screen, on or off? It's a toggle. Or maybe colorblind mode, you toggle it on or off. Those kind of things. So for now, we can just press plus here and we can, like previously, choose does this run in editor and runtime or only runtime. Make sure to select editor and runtime so we can test it in our editor. And let's get our cube game object, which currently has the test script. And let's go ahead and get a function. We can say test script and we can call our create clock function. So basically how this will work now is Whenever we change the value here, the clock will be updated. So if I disable it, we get the clock. And then if I enable it, we again get the clock. But I don't really want it to work like this. What I want to do is let's drop down the toggle and go to label. And I will call this label enable clock. Enter. And then I will come back to the toggle and make sure that is on is set to false. And mm, I want to do when I check the check this check mark, I want the clock to start r running. And when this is disabled, I want the clock to stop updating. So let's go back to our script. And here we need a public public bool. I'll call it um, toggle. Okay. And by default, I will set it to be false. And in our update method, I can say if toggle is true, I want to call create clock. Okay, and let me just semicolon here and the line with a semicolon. Good. Now let's go back into Unity. And instead of calling test the create clock when we change the value here on our toggle, I want to uh, go to test script and find our boolean. Hmm. Let me just save the script again. Maybe it forgot to update. Hmm. Interesting, let me just get the game object again. Test script. Hmm. 
Why is our bullion missing? Really curious. Hmm. I guess we can do it like this. So we we, sh we need to create a method public void toggle on toggle. Let's go ahead and when this is called, we will say if toggle is true, we will set it to be false. Else we set toggle to be true. Okay, so now whenever we click on our toggle, we will run this method. And this method will just make sure that this toggle is turned off or on, which will then update our clock. Let's go back, uh, save this and go back into Unity. And now under test script, let me see, uh, just Unity needs a few moments to update the script. So let's get the cube again and test script and call on toggle. So now if I run the game, just see the clock isn't updating, but now if I enable it, it should start updating, but it's not. Hmm. So on toggle, if toggle is false, if toggle is true, we set it to false. If it's, if it's false, we set it to true. Hmm. And if toggle is true, we generate the clock. Am I missing something here? Interesting. Oh, our test script is for some reason disabled. What? Okay, now if I enable the toggle, we can see our clock is running. If I disable it, it stops working. For some reason, our test script was disabled. Sorry about that. And there you go. Now you understand how toggles work and you can use this basically for many different things in your game. Maybe as we stated, colorblind mode, windowed full screen, anti-aliasing on or off, and things like that. Let's see what's, what is up next under canvas. It's slider. But this lecture is getting pretty long, so we'll cover sliders in the next lecture. With sliders, we can do many useful things, which we'll talk about later. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you then. Goodbye. Hello and welcome back. So last time what we did is we created this toggle. That when we toggle on, we get the current clock. It's updated each frame, and if we turn it off, the clock stops updating. Okay, so let's continue. And now next up is slider. Now sliders are really useful. They're used for volume, master volume, music, sounds, most things in which you have kind of a dynamic value. For example, with our toggle, we can just enable or disable the clock. But with a slider, we can set audio levels to be maybe higher or lower. So in this lecture, we'll show you how to use a slider to actually change the field of view of the player. Now, after this lecture, you will understand how to use sliders for basically anything, audio and whatever you want. But I want to show you how to use sliders to change the field of view in the game. Because if you're creating a first person shooter, having a field of view slider is really important. Most people will will appreciate the field of view slider because you know people are different. Some want to have a higher field of view, some want to have a lower, and it's easy to implement. So I don't I don't see a reason why you wouldn't have a field of view slider in your game. So let's go ahead and I'm just going to change the anchor preset of the field of view slider and position it somewhere below our toggle. Let me just maybe okay something like that, and let's explore our slider. So our slider is a parent, 
much like the button and the toggle and if we drop him down we have the background of the slider which is just a image the default unity ui image then we can change the color of the background we can set the material and check out and uh, change the image type basically this image component is the same as any other image component that you would find in unity next up we have a fill area this is just a rect transform which is the area that we can move around in and then we have the handle and its area its current position and you can of course change the image of the handle to something different I'll just leave it at the knob so let's return to our slider parent and much like the button and any other UI game object it has the interactable true or false does this take any inputs we say yes because we want this to be interactable then we have the color tint the transition sorry and currently it's set to color tint we can change that it's the same as the button and the toggle so I won't go into explaining that and now we have the rectangles for the fill and handle which are already the children of this game object and then we have the direction left to right right to left bottom to top basically how you want your slider to be set up I'm just going to be to leave it at left to right then we have the min value and the maximum value and here you can see if I I, can, I get the slider if I move it around you can see it's moving around in the game and currently it's it's a value from 0 and 1 we can set it to be a whole numbers then it can just be 1 or 0 you see but I can set the value to be maybe 10 and then we have these 10 points to choose from or you can leave it to be a float this really just depends on you okay so let's go ahead and click on our camera and you will see that here we already have a field of view slider in our camera and if I play around with it you will see that my field of view in the game changes so we need to figure out a way to change this slider and make the make the, cam the field of view of the camera change here you can see that these are whole numbers so they're not floats I can't say 54.2 actually I can but it's more precise to use whole numbers for the field of view so let's go ahead and select our slider and make sure that we have whole numbers selected and let's go ahead and get our maximum ca main camera and the maximum field of view here is 179 but that's I believe too much I'm gonna set it to be 120 and the minimum I'll just set to uh, 50 60 okay let's go to our toggle uh, slider sorry and let's say min value is 60 and the maximum value is 120 and now we have this slider that that goes from 60 to 120 and we, we now need to figure out a way to transfer this value this value to the main camera field of view value so let's go ahead and go to our script and we need to get a reference to our camera so let's say public camera and let's call it cam let's go back to our to unity now and if on our cube we should now have a field for our camera okay let's drag our camera in there also we need a reference to our slider so let's say public slider call it I guess slider let's let's say um, FOV slider FOV stands for field of view and when the game starts I want to say FOV slider dot value I'll take its value actually sorry I need the camera dot field of view dot and I will set it to be the FOV slider oops, dot value okay now if I save this and go back into unity now my cube is going to request the slider component and I'm just going to drag it down here and now if I run the game let's set the field of view to be 37 but on the slider it's set to uh, to 98 so it should 
we should change when I start the game. So let's go ahead and play. And in fact, the field, the field of view does change. But now we need, we just need to figure out how to change it when we drag it around in here in our play mode. Let's go back to our slider. And here we have unvalue changed single. So we can also call a method whenever we, we change this value. So what we can do is go to our Visual Studio and I can just say public void, mm, call it maybe FOV slider, Let's say FOV slider. And whenever this value is changed, I'll just get the camera dot field of view and set it to be equal to our FOE slider dot value. Okay, save this. And now back in Unity, we can click, let me just wait for it to update the script, uh, click on this plus sign, select editor and runtime. And now choose our cube game object, which has our script and get the function that is called FOE slider. Okay, so now if I run the game, our slider is changing the field of view of the camera. Now if I select the camera, you can see how if I'm changing the value here, it's also being updated here in the inspector and you can see, let me just get to the scene view. Select 3D here. You can see now if I drop down my game view, if I change these values, you can see how the field of view of the camera updates without any problems. So there you go, this was really easy to set up, but it's a really important option to have in first person shooters or third person games. You would, the same way as we did this for the field of view, you would use the same technique for the, for audio volumes. And basically anything else you can think of which requires use of a slider. So thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello and welcome back. So last time we learned how to use sliders, but if you, you can notice that I don't have the slider anymore or the toggle bar, well, that's because Unity crashed on me and I lost all of my material. So that goes to say you should always be saving, but it doesn't really matter because we're just learning. We're not, not, not building anything yet. So we can continue without any problems. Let's go ahead and right click on canvas UI. Next up below slider is scroll bar. And this scroll bar is very similar to the slider. There's only a slight difference. If we drop down the parent object, we can see that it has a child, which is the sliding area. And then the sliding area has a child, which is the handle. And, this, and in this case, the handle is this sprite and not the knob, which was previously the sprite. So let's go back to our scroll, scroll bar parent. And as usually we have the image component and the scroll bar script. This this object is the same as the previous ones in which it has a transition which can be either none, color tint, sprite swap or animation and then it has the transition options. Then that we have the navigation and the rectangle where we are creating the, the scroll, scroll bar. Then we have the direction similar to the similar to the slider yes but the key difference between the slider and the scroll bar is that in the scroll bar we have kind of steps you can see here we have the number of steps and then we have the size of our kind of s scroll wheel if we can call it that and here we have the value which can be either zero which can range from zero to one where in the slider we could manually s set the range of the value so now what number of steps means is basically if I say four steps here and if I run the game, I will be able to move this four times. So, okay, let's go one, two, three. And that was the fourth one, the first one. So this only has four positions. So this is the first one, then second, third, and fourth. We can of course increase this, let's say 10. And then we'd have the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, 
the fifth one, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and the tenth. You can see that we're not really. This wasn't developed as a slider in which you you just have the freedom to choose whatever you want. This is kind of a slider for presets. So let's say you let me just set okay number of steps four. Maybe you have different a preset of different colors and you would just easily choose them with, like this with a scroll bar. If you have only four items that you want to loop through, using a scroll bar is much more efficient than using a slider. I won't go into too much detail on how we can use it with a script because it's the same thing as a slider. So I'm going to delete it and then continue under UI. The next thing is drop down. Now this is really important. You can see that the drop down is a parent and here we have three children. The first is a label which is just a text field of the options. Option one it just says that. Then we have the little arrow that points downwards and here this is the template which is currently disabled but if I enable it you will see that how it looks like so we're going to be populating all of this all of this well this white space here so if I disable this and go back to our drop down parent you can see that of course we have a image component and then we have the drop down component which as most other components has a interactable option, a transition, which can be either none, color tint, sprite swap or animation. And then it has a navigation, a template, and now we have a caption text, which is just the text that will be written by default here. We can also have that to be an image. And then we have the item text, which is going to be the items down here. It can also be an image. And now here we have the value. Currently, here under let me just start the game and now if I click this you can see we get a drop down of three options we have option A option B and option C this is very useful for example let's say in your main menu in your options you have resolution and then you, the user just clicks on this and gets a drop down of all the resolutions that he can change to and the value here is zero for the first item one for the second item and third for the and two for the third item. So we start from zero. And we can simply just add new options here. I can say option D and just save the subject and play. And now we have the option D here added, added up for us. So now I'm going to show you how to use how to use this with a script. Let's go ahead and go to our script here. Mine is looking different from yours because Unity crashed on me, as I said earlier. So let's first get a reference to our drop down, call it options. I'm going just to delete the FOV slider because we don't need it anymore. Okay, so now we got the options. And I want we we, we want a oh, so just let me. Uh, yeah, I forgot to remove the FOV slider. Just just remove this method. You don't need to remove this method. I needed to do this because Unity crashed and the script is now confused because the script is saved but the project didn't save. So now on value changed we want to call a method. Let's create a public void. I will call this options and what I will do is just change the size of my game object depending on depending on these options. So I'm going to have three options and I'm just going to say size one size two actually let's say size small size medium size large so I'm going to take this cube and just increase it increase its size to be able to do that without it falling down, I'm just going to set use gravity to be false. Now if I run the game, the cube won't fall down. Okay, great. And if I click on this, now we can choose different sizes. But the cube doesn't change its size because we haven't done anything yet. So let's go ahead in our options. Now we want to get from our drop down options the current value. So let's say Let's create a switch statement. I want to switch on options.value. Uh, 
We will be explaining switch statements more in depth in later lectures, but it's just, it's really similar to a if statement, whereas we switch on the value of options. So this can be 0, 1, 2, or 3, or in our case can be 0, 1, or 2. And then here we'll say, in case this is a 1, and now we do something here in these brackets. Let's do that. And after this, we have to break out of this case. And then we have a case for two. And then we break that case after it's done. And I also forgot the case zero. And we break. And also in these switch cases, we need a default case. Let's say default and we just break. So when case is zero, what we want to do is go to our cube and the scale is what we want to change. So when this, when the case is zero, we'll say transform dot scale, local scale, and this takes a vector tree. We can just say one, one and one. I'm getting an error here. I uh, can we use like a method. So we'll say is equal to a new vector tree and just say one, one and one. Okay, so when we choose the first option, we set the scale of the cube to be 1, 1, 1, which is in, in unity, it's referred to 1 meter, which is the default scale currently. So when he chooses the first option, it's going to be the default scale. Then if we choose the second option, I, I will say transform, local scale, local scale, new vector 3. And let's set this to be 3 meters in all directions. And case two, we'll set the transform local scale to be, let's say, five in all directions. So let's save the script and go back into Unity. Now our cube is looking for a options drop down component. So let's drag the drop down from our canvas into the test script on our cube. And now we need to go to our drop down component and scroll down. And on value changed, we need to add a editor and runtime. Let's refer to our cube. And when we change a, the value of this drop down, we want to call the function. We called it options. So now if I run the game, our cube should be increasing. So size small, size medium. There we go. The cube is bigger and size large. And I will show you now, in fact, if, you, if we click on the cube, we can see that the scale is 5 in all x, y, and z. And if I set medium, it's 3 in x, y, and z. And if I set small, it's 1, just as we specified in our script. So there you have it. Now you should understand how you can use drop downs for various different things. For maybe resolution, is it's mostly used for resolutions, but you can use it for anything else if it solves your problem. For you quicker. Thank you for watching and we'll continue in the next lecture. Hello and welcome back. So last time what we did is we got we created this drop down and what we did is we made it so that we can choose one of these options and depending on the option the cube the size of the cube changes. So now that we learned how to use the drop down menu I'm going to go ahead and change the anchor presets to the left and I'm just going to try and position it under the button. Whoops, that's up. Okay, that looks great. Now we have our button and our drop down. You should have the toggle and the slider as well. I lost my files, but it doesn't really matter. Let's go ahead and continue. So I'm going to right click on the canvas, go to UI. And the next thing on our list is input field. So let's go ahead and select that. Now this is going to create a input field and as you can see we have a enter text here and now you can guess this is a field in which we input some kind of information. In the hierarchy the input field is a parent. If we drop it down it has a placeholder and a text. So the placeholder is basically a text that says currently enter text. I can change it to enter username or enter password whatever, well, let's just keep it at enter text. 
and the text is going to be the text that we enter in here. So we're going to be, let, let me just show you. If I click now on this input field, I can write something. And you can see that whatever we write here is going to be translated to the text here. And the text will later then, we'll use whatever it's written here and we can do all sorts of things with it. So let's return to our input field parent. And as as most of the UI elements, it has a image component. Let's drop it down. We've seen it 10 times already. And then we have the input field component. As always, it's interactable, either true or false. And then we have the transitions, which can either be none, color tint, sprite swap, or animation. We've explained this, so I won't go into explaining this. And then we have the text component, which is basically the text here from the child. And then we have the current text, which is blank. But if I were to populate this text with, let's say, something you can see as I'm writing it, it's being written here in the inspector. Let's just delete this. You can also select this. Next up, we have character limit zero by default means there's no limit, but we can say that the limit is five characters. And now if I start writing, I'll just smash my keyboard, you can see it stops at five characters. Let's go ahead and set the limit to be zero. So it's actually unlimited. And then we have the content type which by default is set to standard, but we have a lot of options here. We have auto-corrected, which will auto-correct your messages if you're running this on maybe a mobile device. Then we have integer number. This will only take in numbers. So right now I'm mashing my keyboard as crazy, but I was hitting letters. Now if I start hitting numbers, it reads numbers perfectly. Then we have the decimal number, same as integer, it will only take numbers, but this will take only decimal numbers. Then we have the alphanumeric, which only takes words and numbers. It won't take any special characters. I'm trying to write something here. Special characters, it doesn't work. Then we have a name, email address, and password, where as password will be, you see we get these asterisks here. Then we have pin. It's gonna be, it can only be a numeric value, so I can only insert numbers here, but they will also be hidden behind these asterisks. And then we have custom, we can create our own prefab, our own content type. We get these, you, you can choose which, 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 which keyboard type we will be getting. Is it going to be the default one, the ASCII capable? a URL, a num number pad, a phone pad, or a Nintendo network account if you're building a game for Nintendo consoles. But I'm going to leave the content type to be standard and the line type, type I'll just say single line. Then we have the placeholder text, which is currently enter text. Then we have the caret blink rate. This is, the caret is this black line you see here. If I say something, if I, let me just, um, write something here say now you can see it's blinking really slowly but we, we can increase that rate of blinking you can see not now it blinks much faster now it's that's too fast let's set it to maybe 0.6 that's a nice blinking rate here we have the width of our carrot now it can be really fast really thick or just leave it at one which is feels natural then we can also get a custom color for our for our carrot, the, current, the default is black, but we can, if you want to have a blue one. And then we can have a selection color, which is what the color when we select it, we can also change that to be whichever color you wish, but I'll just leave it at the bluish one. I like it. And then we have read only. Now if I enable read only, that means that I'm only going to be able to read from this text, I, I won't be able to write anything in here. Let's disable that. And then we have hide mobile input, which will just hide any mobile input that you might be getting. Let me just delete this text. And down here we have on value changed and on edit, on add and edit. So basically we can either call a script whenever we write something in here. So each time I write a new letter, I can call a script or when I'm done writing and I hit enter, I can then call a script. Let's go ahead and delete this. And what I want to do is I will replace the text here 
which says placeholder with whatever we write in this input field. So let's go ahead and navigate to our script. And like always, when we're working with any of these UIs, we want to get a reference to them. So public input field, and I'll say user text. And now I'm going to, let me just drop down this method and I'll say public void input field method. And basically each time, let's, let's first call this method when we're done with the, when we're done with the editing. So first we'll call it when on end edit, and then we'll call it on value changed to just demonstrate how things work. So when we call this method, what I want to do is get the text. So let's say text, and I will set its text to be equal to the input field. Did we call it input field? No, we called it user text, sorry. So the text the text is going to be equal to user text dot text. And now I can save this and go back into Unity. Now on my cube, where the script is attached, it will be asking for a input field component. Just drag our input field from our canvas down into the user text. And let's go to our input field. Now here on end edit, I will add a new function which will be running in editor and runtime and the game object is cube. And from cube, I will call test script and input field. So now if I run the game, the text still says placeholder, but if we say, oops, sorry about that. We, I forgot to change the content type to standard. Let's run it again. Now I can say hello there. And if I hit enter, it's updated up here. I can also delete this and hit enter. Whenever I hit enter, it's updated. So whenever we type something in and hit enter, this script is called, but let's, let's delete that. Let's call it on value change. So whenever we change the value of the text, the input field, I'm going to select again, editor and runtime, get our cube in here. And from the cube, we'll say test script and input field. So let's go ahead and start this. And now I, it should be updating as I write it. And there you go. Hello there. How are you? You see it updates even when I'm deleting it. So you, you could use this to get information from the player, maybe his username, password, email address, and then when he inserts it, you save it in a different file. We'll talk about saving later. This lecture is getting lengthy. But you now do understand how input fields work. And now that we're done with this one, I'll just move it next to his friend, friends on the right side, which, whoops, this is 150. 150. And then position Y will say 100, 100, now 90. Okay, that looks great. You should be having more of these UI elements. And thank you for watching. So next time we will, we will be covering, well, we're basically done. So I, I guess next time we will wrap things up and finish with our canvas. And thank you for watching and I'll see you then. Bye. Welcome back. So last time we spoke about the input field and we created a script that when we enter some text, some text, it's just transferred up here. So let's continue with our canvas exploration. And if we right click on canvas, go to UI, we can see that the next thing is actually canvas. But we already have our canvas. The canvas is the parent in which all other UI elements are placed, but we can have another canvas in our game if you wish, but I don't see the point in that. So I'm just going to delete this canvas. Continuing, we have a panel. Now a panel, if we enter it and go to our scene, you can see it took up all the space in the canvas. Well, this is kind of an area to make things much more convenient for you. You can see if I'm resizing it, I'm getting really precise numbers. So for example, I can have it to be this size and then I can place all of these other elements into my panel. Let's do that. And now I can just move around my panel and all of these elements will follow around my panel really nicely just makes working with UI easier for you. There's not much else to say about the panel. It has the image component like everything else. We can disable it and we will still be able to move around our 
elements that are inside the panel. And the next thing under UI is going to be scroll view. Now a scroll view, this is how it looks if I run the game now. You can see it allows me to, sc to scroll horizontally and would allow me to scroll, I mean vertically and horizontally if I had any more elements. This can be used for basically if you want a shop or a talent tree in your game so your user has to scroll inside of it. Let's just open this up and see what we, what we have. We have a viewport child which has some, this basically places the content inside of it. Here you can see that we can scroll down because the, the content is is going from this point to this point. So now if I were to size like this, I would be able to scroll horizontally. So if I run the game, you will see that I, I can indeed now scroll horizontally, but I'm still not seeing anything. Don't worry about that. We'll get to that soon. Then we have a scroll bar horizontal, which is this one, and a vertical one, which is this one. Now, scroll views are really useful for, well, we said shops, talent trees. So let me show you an example. If with the scroll view selected, I can right click and say UI and add a button here. And you can see my button is now inside the scroll view. And I can set it here. Maybe change the text of the button to, let's say, item one. And let's create another uh, button. Oops, I, I didn't copy the button, I copied the text. Let's just copy and paste the button and drag it down here. So now if I run the game, you can see I can, oops, I we need to put the buttons under the viewport. Sorry about that. You see we have our content here. It's basically where our buttons should be. Sorry, this, they should be under content. Okay, let's run the game now. So now if I scroll, you can see we, uh, we're actually moving through these lists. And we can select these buttons and they could have different functionalities. I can also scroll with my mouse wheel, but it's really slow. We could increase the speed here. We have, um, if we select our scroll view parent, we have the scroll view component. Then we have the move types to be elax elastic, unrestricted or clamped. Just leave it to elastic. And then we have the electricity, the inertia. And here is the scroll sensitivity. So if I increase this, I should be able to scroll much smoother now. Yeah, I'm scrolling much faster. So this is a really, we can also drag it around. This can be disabled or enabled. If you're maybe doing a top down RPG, like Diablo or Path of Exile, where you have massive talent trees, you would you would use this approach so the player can drag around to easier find the talents that he wants to use. Then you ju just have buttons that, when enabled, would give him different stats and abilities. Okay, that's about scroll view, and let's continue. Basically, the scroll view you will just use this combined with everything else that we learned with buttons, text, whatever you need to create shops or what your game desires, what your game needs. So next up on canvas, if we go to UI, we see the final thing here is event system. But actually in my hierarchy, we already have an, an, an event system made, but you don't remember creating an event system. Well, this is because as soon as you create a canvas, a event system is created by default with the canvas because without the event system, you wouldn't be able to use any of these UI elements. Let me show you. So now if I run the game, you can see all of our buttons are working. I can do all of this. But if I were to click on the event system and disable it, I can't click on anything now. That's because we don't have any event system that controls these buttons, these UI elements. So let's re-enable the event system. And now you can see as soon as down here in the inspector, we have all of our information where our pointer is, its position, is it hovering over anything. So basically, if I hover over click me, it's going to set, it's, it knows the pointer is here. And now if I click it, it says, uh huh, he clicked the button, that button, and he knows what to do, as well as this one. And it knows that the size is, is small currently or medium. It always knows what I'm hovering over. It also knows the item 
the ID of the item, so it's two for size large, zero, zero for small, and one for medium. It also knows that I'm now writing in an input field, hello. And of course here it knows we are in a scroll view. So it's really important to have the event system. Now, if I were to delete, if I were to delete the canvas and the event system together and just create a new canvas, you can see that we instantly get a new event system. So if your UI elements sometimes aren't working and you don't know why, it's probably because you have disabled the event system. Just re-enable it and everything should be fine. So to end this lecture, I'll just save our scene. And under our main scene, I called it main, is everything that we've learned so far about canvases. Next time we will start with programming and game development in general. We'll teach you some awesome practices and how you can make cool games really quick quickly. The canvas is done, so I will thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next lecture.